how do we fight gentrification? The bigger they are, the harder they fall. There are fights it is impossible to win and impossible to avoid. Gentrification is one of these. It is a ceaseless earthquake, breaking up communities, shaking us from one neighborhood to another, or into outright homelessness. The ones who take our place face the same fate in our wake. We have to reimagine these defensive struggles as offensive initiatives. That's the only way they could turn out to our advantage. What could we gain in fighting, even as the ground is snatched from beneath our feet? How could these losing battles position us to take on the structures that produce gentrification? Prologue, setting our priorities. Gentrification is one of the most pressing issues facing anarchists in the U.S., and one of the most paralyzing. All around the world, people are being forced from their homes by the rising cost of living as development changes the character of neighborhoods. We often find ourselves swept up in this process, displacing poorer people with less racial privilege, only to be pushed out ourselves when the next wave hits. For more and more of us, engaging with this topic is not a choice, but a matter of survival. Essentially, gentrification is the process of the rich getting richer and the poor getting poorer, embodied in real estate. It's produced in part by the asymmetrical dynamics between race and class. For example, when poor white people pave the way for middle-class white people in formerly non-white neighborhoods, though the same dynamics can play out between other demographics. Gentrification is polarizing because it can reveal real differences in goals and strategy about the most controversial issues of our time, race and class, leadership and autonomy. One common response is a sort of consumer politics. We blame those who move into neighborhoods that are, quote, not theirs. But this focuses on the last stage of the process, not the forces driving it. What do we expect renters to do if they can't afford to stay in their previous neighborhoods? Should poor white gentrifiers work higher paying jobs so they can afford to stay in predominantly white neighborhoods? Setting aside the question of whether that would be desirable, it often isn't even possible. Much anti-gentrification rhetoric implies a static notion of community, something monolithic and changeless. But not even the ecosystems that were here before the first cities were static. A narrative of mere conservation is reactive and doomed to fail, especially in our era of maximum fluidity in circulation. Change is inevitable, and categories of who belongs and who doesn't should be anathema to us. We need a more precise way of framing what is destructive about imposed development, and to juxtapose a transformative narrative of our own. In short, we can't halt the effects of capitalism simply by pitting moral imperatives against economic pressures. To put a stop to gentrification, we would have to abolish capitalism itself. Instead, let's begin by asking what we hope to get out of gentrification struggles in hopes of formulating a strategy that is offensive rather than defensive. Here are some possible goals around which an anti-gentrification struggle might cohere. We might seek to memorialize what is being destroyed, for example, by creating memory projects or museums about the former inhabitants and character of the neighborhood. Frequently adopted by non-confrontational initiatives, this approach at least acknowledges gentrification. But without an emphasis on ongoing struggles, it can promote resignation rather than resistance. For people with comparative racial and class privilege to support the initiatives of those who have less. This often takes the problematic form of accepting the leadership of recognized community leaders who don't necessarily have the same interests as less influential locals. Supporting the initiatives of those who are not positioned as community leaders can bring all sorts of messy internal conflicts to the surface, which may be a good thing. To prevent the displacement of the most vulnerable inhabitants, or else the original ones who may not be the most vulnerable. To slow or freeze development. This could dictate a legalistic strategy or a confrontational one, according to circumstances and the politics of the participants. Like the former goal, this is comparable to environmentalists trying to save specific areas of wilderness. With a great deal of effort and leverage, it is sometimes possible to win concessions from corporations or the state, though these are usually temporary and the consequence is often that development simply intensifies elsewhere. To get revenge upon developers, 
as an end in itself. To build ties on the basis of the struggle against gentrification. This is worthwhile, although there are obvious structural challenges in seeking to found connections on the very process that is breaking up and dispersing a community. To connect struggles over housing and land to other struggles relating to work, environment, or public space. This could mean intensifying the general hostility towards policing and surveillance in embattled neighborhoods, or fostering hostility to developers and landowners in such a way as to build support for autonomous spaces and infrastructure such as occupied gardens, social centers, or housing complexes. To set precedents for struggle that can be inspiring wherever gentrification is taking place, such as developing practices of autonomous communal assembly and decision-making, or popularizing specific offensive tactics. Selecting from and adding to this list might help anarchists to evaluate their effectiveness and chart a course consistent with their long-term strategies. In the following story, told from the perspectives of five participants, some anarchists in a gentrifying neighborhood set out to fight the most egregious development project by any means necessary. Pyrrhic Victories Small-town anarchists take on green capitalist developers. A story in five voices. Chapel Hill is a medium-sized college town nestled between bigger cities and the central Piedmont of North Carolina. It has always had a modest reputation for radical politics, and over the past decade it has become a local hub of anarchist activity. Meanwhile, facilitated by the influx of student loan money, Property values have risen more quickly in Chapel Hill than the surrounding areas, steadily forcing out the town's poor and black populations. The following story was just one in a series of space-oriented conflicts in which anarchists have participated. It was preceded by a multi-year showdown with town officials over use of the so-called town commons for monthly really, really free markets, see Rolling Thunder No. 4, and followed by high-profile building occupations around the Occupy movement of 2011 to 2012. The north side neighborhood in which the action takes place is less than a mile from the university, Marshall Street. May 2011. I wake up to strangers' voices. Someone is in our house. It's the people from the rental company. They're showing it to potential buyers. They didn't warn us, didn't knock, just let themselves in. I have no recourse, my name isn't on the lease, and we're over permitted occupancy. I should be driving them out, and instead I'm trying to figure out how to hide the fucking cat food bowl without being seen. My ex and I were already kicked out of one apartment complex in this town for being one tenant too many. Like so many other poor people in this country, I can't afford to invoke my legal rights. Most of the other renters I knew on the street are already gone, forced out by landlords eager to take advantage of soaring real estate values. The first ones to go were the black families. Now, poor households of predominantly white folks are disappearing. This neighborhood is called Northside. It was built a century ago, primarily to house black service workers at the nearby university. During segregation, it was a center of black culture and economy. I'm told James Brown and Ella Fitzgerald performed here, a block from my house. I've been connected to this neighborhood since I was 10. My mother enrolled me in the swim team at the community center here. We used to race against teams from the middle-class swimming pools. One of them was actually called Country Club. That's not to say I shared the same reality as young black folks who lived around here. The one I knew best in elementary school was shot to death at the McDonald's up the street. Something unthinkable for a white kid like me. A decade and a half later, in the 1990s, I moved here with my partner, after the fiasco in which we were kicked out of her apartment. We were right next to the projects. Our neighbors would come over to use our landline to order pizza or call their families. When white students moved in across the street, the neighborhood kids hassled them and took stuff off their porch. But one night I left my computer in the front yard, my only valuable possession, and it was still there the next day. It was nice to feel welcome. Another decade and a half has passed since then. Now the houses of the neighbors who used our phone have been flattened and replaced with fancy pop-up condominiums full of white students. The church and the Ethiopian restaurant have been flattened too, along with a whole block of the former black business district. 
In their place, casting its shadow across my present house in the remnants of what was a multi-ethnic working-class neighborhood, is a ten-story green capitalist monstrosity, Greenbridge. November 1990 Long before this story begins, when Northside was still predominantly black, the Chapel Hill police carried out a SWAT team attack against it under the name Operation Ready Rock. In Lockdown America, Police and Prisons in the Age of Crisis, Christian Parenti describes this as one of the most egregious fishing expeditions of its era. The warrant allowed the police to search every person and vehicle on a full block. As the warrant request put it, we believe that there are no innocent people at this place. Dressed in combat boots, green camouflage battle uniforms, body armor, hoods, masks, goggles, and Kevlar helmets, 45 officers, armed with a wide array of weapons, stormed the block from all directions, cutting off every path of escape and combing the area with drug-sniffing dogs. Whites were allowed to leave, while more than 100 black people were searched. SWAT commandos smashed in the front door of a pool hall and forced the occupants to the floor at gunpoint. While the captives were searched and interrogated, the bar was ransacked. The commotion left one elderly man trembling on the floor in a pool of his own urine. The raid netted 13 arrests for minor drug possession. Some of those who had been terrorized and humiliated filed a class action suit, but no officers were ever so much as reprimanded. A decade and a half later, developers bought the land that had been the site of that raid in order to build Greenbridge, what they hoped would be a pioneering beacon of green capitalist profit and sustainability. In this sequence, it's easy to see the direct connection between the so-called war on drugs targeting black communities and the gentrification subsequently displacing them. In the end, the illegal drug dealing that had made the neighborhood an unattractive target for developers may have disrupted the community less than the development facilitated by invasive efforts to, quote, clean it up. Spring 2007 we moved into that house around the same time the developers were buying up the block at the end of the street. We took over renting from a white couple in grad school. They were getting married and moving somewhere, quote, nicer. As a household of local anarchists who had already been living together, we were excited to find a house we could afford in a multi-ethnic, working-class neighborhood. We knew it was being gentrified, but we didn't think it would help for us to leave the house to another pair of grad students. Instead, we intended to make our presence cost developers more than it benefited them. We can't always choose the positions we occupy in the economy, but we can choose how we occupy them. We got to know our neighbors swiftly. Three houses were occupied by families recently arrived from a small town in central Mexico. One of the young men sometimes slept on our couch when he came back too late. On the other side of us was a 90-year-old African-American woman who had lived there since the first houses were built in the neighborhood. Her sister and cousin still lived on the street. She generously shared stories with us on her front porch, recounting her youth in the countryside picking cotton in the neighborhood's early days. Across the street, there were two houses occupied by a revolving cast of students who passed through too quickly to be worth trying to get to know, and one house occupied by black renters. Like our house and the households from Guanajuato, their house always had a crowd hanging out in front. First, the kids came out to join us when we played badminton in the road. Eventually, we became friends with the older folks, who would have us watch the youngest when there was trouble. There was a police substation at the end of the street, part of their efforts to colonize and subdue the neighborhood. But when a conflict escalated to gunfire in front of our neighbor's house one night, the police took more than half an hour to show up. On the other hand, one morning I got into it with some officers who were groundlessly frisking and insulting a young black man on our street. When they let him go in order to fuck with me, he stuck around to record it on his phone. We didn't know each other, but in moments like that, the neighborhood felt cohesive. I was the only one in our house who had actually grown up in town. Not unusual in a region seeing so much change. Some of the language criticizing gentrification centered on the displacement of locals, but I thought that was the wrong narrative. I didn't want to risk giving anyone ammunition to delegitimize our Mexican neighbor's right to be there, for example. For me, the most important thing was the working-class character of the neighborhood, affordability and solidarity, not some static notion of who belonged. Then we learned that the formerly black-owned business district at the end of our street was going to be leveled. 
a group fronted by a dot-com millionaire named Tim Tobin, had received the go-ahead to build a $56 million sustainable condominium complex with units between $300,000 and $1.4 million apiece. Over the following months, the implications of this set in. Rents that had already been rising would soar. More people would lose their homes. At the same time, the development gave us a clear target to focus on, all the more egregious in that it framed environmental responsibility as a selling point for the wealthy, offering the narrative of sustainability to help rich people feel good about themselves as they profited at the expense of those who could not afford million-dollar green condominiums. Summer 2007 Once a week, we pulled an aluminum bicycle cart loaded with boxes of produce, bread, cheese, and other groceries through the neighborhood, distributing for free what we acquired by skimming off the top of consumer society. It was a way to meet neighbors, hear stories about the area, and initiate conversations about police, landlords, and the impending development, Greenbridge. I often converse with an ex-Panther who had done time in Terre Haute. Other locals talked about rent prices or everyday work shit. Whenever we met a family with members in prison, we'd connect them with the anti-prison group that operated out of our garage so they could get books and other resources in to their relatives. One day, we learned that a household down the way that had taken groceries from us for months was getting evicted. Two weeks later, we heard from guys painting the outside that the cops had contacted the landlord and asked him to replace the previous tenants with, quote, college types. Other families brought similar stories of anger and frustration. Those face-to-face interactions later became the basis for efforts to fight the development. The groceries themselves were arbitrary. When they were perceived as charity, they may have even been an obstacle to connecting with people. The important thing was to open a direct avenue of communication with our neighbors that allowed us to bypass the representational and conservative politics of the existing institutions. Years later, the church ran the only food distribution in the neighborhood. We had become too busy with other struggles to compete with their program, which received above board the donations from grocery stores that we had previously obtained on the sly. They did good work, feeding hundreds of people, including many anarchists. But it's possible that if we had maintained another program, maybe focusing on something else, it could have served as the basis for a more collective and confrontational response to gentrification than anything the church would have countenanced. Fall 2007 I attended a neighborhood association meeting soon after I moved into Northside. I hoped to learn more about the power dynamics of my new home. And I did in a historically black neighborhood with thousands of residents, largely working class and many living on pensions or social security. The only people at the meeting were four cops, two white and two black, one older black homeowner, and two paid black staff members of a local local homeowner's organization, one of whom was a landlord who rented out multiple homes. The entire meeting was given over to these three black landowners, pointing out households in the neighborhood that they believed were involved in crime. Fear of black youth was palpable from both black and white participants. I didn't utter a word, hoping to make my face forgettable for the four cops in the room. The point of the meeting was for homeowners to serve as police informants. Years later, this homeowners organization was accorded a respected role in negotiations with Greenbridge's developers giving authority to the minority of neighbors who financially benefited from rising property costs. The landlord behind the nonprofit saw herself as having good intentions. Her organization assisted black families in becoming homeowners in order to maintain an African-American presence in the area. She wanted the neighborhood to become prosperous. She was one of the first people to sound the alarm when the developers first bought the property to build Greenbridge. But from our perspective, the prosperity she wanted could only arrive at the expense of the poorer families of color, whose parents would lose their homes while their teenagers ended up in jail. In the end, neither the wealthy black neighborhood she hoped to foster, nor the ethnically diverse working-class enclave we wanted to protect, were realistic outcomes. They only existed as strategic differences between those who opposed the development. Winter 2008 I went to a neighborhood meeting advertising a discussion about the development. Out of maybe a dozen people, I was the only renter. Most of the others were white, and three were cops. Before the meeting, I had wondered why none of the advertisements were bilingual, 
and there was no option for Spanish to English translation, when in three of the households around mine, none of the adults were fluent in English. There were two college activists observing, who expressed interest in organizing around this issue. They seemed to be connected to the one outspoken middle-aged black woman at the meeting, who was the only other person there who lived on my street. She was the only person in the neighborhood I met who thought safety could come from more police on our block. I found out later that she supported the proposed condominiums because she was on staff of the homeowners organization in the neighborhood that stood to benefit from the neighborhood gaining economic and social status. And at that time, the developers' promises of affordable housing units hadn't yet proved false. All the other homeowners at that meeting were opposed to the condominiums. They were living on fixed incomes and couldn't afford an increase in their property taxes. Neighbors I spoke with elsewhere either opposed the development or hadn't heard of it at all. Many were already feeling the effects of gentrification. Increased police violence, landlords evicting black families to rent to white college students, African and African-American business owners losing their buildings. The college activists who wanted to organize around gentrification did their work in the community at neighborhood meetings like the one I described, and at a popular black church in the next block. Along with activists from other parts of town, the college kids kept telling me that there was no consensus from the black community about the development, especially because the minister of the church was initially in favor of it. So they couldn't organize against the proposed condominiums. They could only do education about it. Spring 2008. They began leveling buildings, including the old hotel and a house on the property across the street from the planned condominiums. Anti-gentrification banners appeared on both of these, some of the first indications of the struggle that was to play out outside the formal neighborhood structures. The developers held a groundbreaking ceremony in April. The same month, a pastor at the church gave a sermon identifying the development as a form of racism and calling on the congregation to do something about it. Meanwhile, students found a DVD promoting the new condominiums, in which interviews with locals were framed in such a way that they seemed to be promoting the development. The local media had done the same thing in interviews with at least one displaced business owner, editing out her anger and frustration. The students screened the DVD at the info shop and on campus. Some of the developers showed up to do spin control, and arguments ensued. Then, seemingly out of nowhere, a small crowd raided the building contractor's office in a nearby city. A dozen or more masked individuals threw flyers in the air and carried furniture out of the office onto the lawn, chanting, We'll evict you first. The contractor responded by calling whomever he thought might be connected to anarchists in the area and telling them that next time he would respond with armed force. This set the tone for the whole conflict, though it took several more months for the next round to begin. Spring 2009 that April, lovely green posters appeared, announcing that the development was canceled. Citing a wide array of neighbors' concerns, they purported to represent a statement from the developers themselves. Identical handbills also appeared on every car and door in a five-block radius. The posters provided the contact information of the developers, who were forced to release an embarrassing public statement disavowing the cancellation. Occurring shortly before construction began, this made the company appear vulnerable in the public eye, while conveying that the opposition had a sense of humor and would not be limited to traditional political dialogue. Local media outlets, even the most liberal of which never came out against Greenbridge, nonetheless ate up the hoax, and Greenbridge's awkward disavowal of the apology forced them to place the development under new scrutiny. Meanwhile, a coalition had formed to respond to the development. The steering committee included religious leaders, a county commissioner, the director of the neighborhood community center, and local business owners. Students and professors from the nearby universities were also involved. Some of us went to the meetings. We had a great deal of respect for some of the participants, chiefly the ones who, like us, were there because they actually lived in the neighborhood. Two of us joined the coalition's action working group. Meeting in the church's second floor conference room, we drafted a statement expressing explicit opposition to the development itself, from the position of both the church and Northside as a whole. The idea was to go door-to-door -door talking with neighbors and getting signatures in support of the statement, which would then be published in the local papers. 
undermining the developer's spin. The hope was that this narrative would legitimize the broad-based opposition to the development, providing a foundation from which a variety of groups could feel confident resisting the impending construction. But when our group brought the statement to the larger coalition, it was blocked outright. Some participants seemed amazed we would even propose such a thing. They assumed the point of the coalition was to negotiate with the developers in order to obtain more affordable housing, or free energy credits for Northside neighbors. Many had no hope that the project could be blocked, with a law already purchased and the permit secured. We argued that any concessions the developers offered would be beside the point, as households were evicted or driven out by higher rents and property taxes. A professor who offered school credit to students who participated in this extracurricular activity argued that we should work with the developers rather than against them. The pastor who had delivered the fiery sermon against Greenbridge remained silent. This should not have taken us by surprise. We were on a different page than the people who controlled the coalition. Poor renters were underrepresented and had little influence, especially behind the scenes. Professors and other leaders took their roles as representatives and mediators for granted, imposing their political assumptions as the horizon of possibility. Local business owners could not risk alienating the developers. When gentrification was complete, Greenbridge residents would be their new customers. It seemed like a losing battle. Yet, in refusing to take a concrete stand or develop tactics that could hit the developers where it hurt, the coalition gave up the opportunity to negotiate from a position of strength. For a while, we were dispirited and didn't do anything. Finally, in a mixture of despair and curiosity, we went door to door with a statement by ourselves, just to see what would happen. The results surprised us. Practically everyone we spoke to was enthusiastic about the statement. The actual residents of the neighborhood had a very different attitude than their would-be representatives and supporters. We had made the classic mistake of conflating representation with reality. In the end, over 60 households publicly signed the statement, identifying future residents as racist and urging no one to buy condominiums. We bought space to print it in the local paper ourselves and distributed hundreds of copies of it in poster form. This incensed the developers who had no recourse against our informal initiative. Yet in accepting our role as the marginalized opposition, with no obvious way for people to get involved beyond signing the statement, we had ceded the ground of participatory action. From then on, though we were never limited by reformist hang-ups or the hindrances of institutional transparency, it was difficult to position ourselves so that others could join us, even though the majority of residents shared our opposition to the development. Without an autonomous neighborhood assembly or something of the like, withdrawing from the coalition was as much an acknowledgement of weakness as a principled stand or strategic decision. Two years later, with a wave of insurrections, occupations, and encampments sweeping the globe, this omission became obvious. Another slow summer afternoon staffing the info shop. I look up from my magazine to see an unfamiliar man walk into the store, eyeing the shelves only momentarily before striding up to the counter. He sports khaki shorts, a designer polo shirt, expensive sunglasses, and the falsely hearty, somewhat distracted demeanor of the rich and busy. I dislike him immediately, but this isn't just a subcultural space, so I try to avoid judging solely by appearances. Perhaps he's a wealthy liberal here for his copy of The Nation, but then I hear in a nasal northeastern accent, I'm Michael Cucchiera. I'm one of the partners at Greenbridge. Are you fucking serious? This guy is a multimillionaire investor in the project we've been fighting for the last three years. He knows this is hostile territory. He must have some reason for being here. I clamp on my best poker face as he launches into a rambling story about how development is going to become a positive force in the community, including a litany of ill-informed or blatantly racist remarks about the neighborhood as condos are gentrifying. He's droning on about the different businesses they're considering for the retail spaces underneath the condos, and how they want to find ones that will be the right fit for the development in the neighborhood. When suddenly I realize where he's going. And since your bookstore has strong roots in the progressive community here, and Greenbridge wants to work with our community partners to make connections with other local interests, we want to see if you'd be interested in moving into one of our retail spaces. 
With a Herculean effort, I maintain a straight face as he lays out his pitch. One thousand square feet of brand new space, tall ceilings, free reign to build and renovations. A 40-seat theater upstairs we can use for film screenings. Flexible move-in terms. And to top it all, an unimaginably cheap rent, probably half of the market value, with three years of rent control to ensure it stays affordable for us. It's a dream offer, the ultimate insider deal, unthinkable in the context of skyrocketing downtown prices. He must know that we're desperate to move out of our cramped, frequently flooding space, but can't secure any nearby retail space on our shoestring budget. We can't afford to expand, to move, or to stay. It's a catch-22, and here's the perfect solution. But what does Greenbridge get out of it? He's got some nice platitudes about how our missions are similar, social justice, concern for the environment, but he doesn't have to say the obvious truth. They're looking to buy off the opposition. They've already done it with the neighborhood churches. After meetings with the pastors and a token donation to the Boys and Girls Club, they got the leaders to sell out their congregations and divide the feisty resistance that neighbors had begun to mount. But the anarchist scene around this info shop has been implacable. We've hosted multiple anti-Greenbridge discussions and organizing events, and were known as a beacon of intransigent opposition to development. When a bomb threat had been called in, halting construction, prompting panic among the developers, one of them had asked in desperation, can't we go talk to someone at that bookstore and get them to stop this? So what better way to neutralize an enemy and gain public legitimacy than by moving us in? And in contrast to the alternative proposal of a 24-hour mini-mart, our disproportionately white project would attract what he referred to as the right kind of people. The developers were willing to sacrifice substantial retail space profit to enlist us in the process of gentrification. In one fell swoop, they could shut us up, appear progressive, and obtain a tax write-off for offering below-market rent to a nonprofit organization. That's a lot of birds to kill with one stone. I nod politely through our conversation as he yammers on about the supposed affinity between his green capitalist development and our anarchist info shop culminating in an anecdote about his recent trip to Iceland, where he spent a weekend in a cabin with the CEO of Walmart. I swear, I couldn't make this up. At negotiations about green standards for consumer products. Isn't it exciting not just to be outraged, but to be part of the solution? I don't know how much longer I can keep a straight face. Finally, he leaves me his cell phone number so that once I'd checked with the collective, I could call him to work out the details. Proffers a clammy handshake and plastic smile, and strides out, not pretending to take any interest in the merchandise, among which anti-gentrification stickers and zines critiquing green capitalism feature prominently. Do rich people actually think that with enough money they can buy anything they want, even the loyalty of people that hate them and everything they stand for? I had learned two important things. First, they were so uncertain of their position, and were having so much trouble leasing retail units, that it was worth it to them to take a loss to placate us. Second, it never pays to behave. We were only being offered that opportunity on account of our uncompromising hostility. If we'd played nice from the beginning, we would have had no leverage. Only naive liberals think that you initiate negotiations by making concessions. Yet even if we had wanted to cash in our white privilege and sell out our community, doing so would mean losing whatever leverage we had. There was only one path. Open war. Fall 2009. A tremendous crane hung over our neighborhood, the claw of doom. I passed under it every day as I left my house. I imagined climbing to the top of it, dropping a banner about gentrification, and locking myself to it. I imagined the shitstorm of controversy that would ensue as community leaders and millionaire investors tripped over each other to tell the media that I didn't represent the neighborhood. I tried to imagine where we would go when we couldn't afford to live in our house anymore. Later, when it was too late, I learned that others had fantasized about doing the same thing. Winter 2010 In January, vandals hit the building site. Police reported that they spray-painted 14 concrete columns, 21 walls, 5 doors, and a forklift, for a total of $11,000 damage. The paint was cleaned up immediately, and local media declined to report what it said, although one paper quoted a local who had seen Greenbridge is racist, painted there the previous year. Rumor had it that the developer's offices down the street had also been attacked. 
In February, someone called in a second bomb threat, interrupting construction again. A local puppet troupe reworked Hansel and Gretel as an allegory about the developers. The letter section of the local paper was full of debate. Defenders always insisted that gentrification had been going on in the neighborhood for decades already, as if Greenbridge wasn't exacerbating the process. Seriously, is it okay to kick someone just because he's down? There was a deep cultural gulf between the mayor, the developers, and the community leaders who wielded legitimate political power on one side, and the disillusioned, disenfranchised, and vulnerable on the other. No one thought Greenbridge could be stopped, let alone that stopping it would halt gentrification. But we knew what side we were on, and we weren't going to go quietly. In those days, you could walk around town and pick out burn Greenbridge graffiti every few blocks. Posters appeared regularly on the walls decrying gentrification. There was a whole series urging action against anyone who bought one of the condominiums. Some posters were numbered, number 32 of 1,000, perhaps after the example of Abby Hoffman, who reputedly released two pigs into an apartment store painted number one and number three. We sighted men in khaki pants going around town blacking out anti-gentrification posters and graffiti with spray paint. They weren't city employees. Presumably, the developers hired them. Eventually, someone wrote a letter to the editor of the local paper reporting these sightings, accusing Greenbridge employees of vandalism. After that, the spray painting ceased. Instead, enormous stickers depicting a view of the Earth from space appeared over posters. As if we were doing battle with yuppie environmentalists in the cartoon version of our lives. Summer 2010 Every day the building inched closer to completion. The local independent paper wrote their first piece on the development when it was about to open. The article framed Greenbridge as the future and black and low-income residents as the past. It claimed that the Student Community Coalition had been making headway until, quote, talks were derailed after vandals sprayed graffiti on Greenbridge, called in a bomb threat, and plastered a flyer around town, falsely claiming the project was being halted. It was clear to me that actions like that were working to delegitimize the development, but I had a hard time explaining this to others. As a student and one of the only anarchists who remained involved in the coalition, I found myself struggling to translate the impact and in intent of such actions without taking responsibility for them. Positioned as the public face of the struggle, the coalition caught the flack for them. Tim Tobin's lawyers had sent the coalition letters threatening prosecution for multiple felonies, and Tobin asked the university to arrest the students he believed were involved. Indeed, I was arrested soon thereafter, though for something apparently unrelated. The response within the coalition made it clear how scared people were of the developers. By summer 2010, I had finally left the coalition myself, unable to stomach the internal power dynamics and liberal politics. Meanwhile, the coalition was turning away from organizing against Greenbridge. With the buildings nearing completion, why continue to fight? In some ways, everything had played out like a caricature. On one side, a well-organized official group had gathered large numbers to talk and talk, making paltry requests the developers had no reason to honor. On the other side, secretive individuals had succeeded in ruining the development's reputation, but failed to turn those isolated actions into momentum that brought more people into the struggle. In public, anarchists made very clear what we were unwilling to do attend meetings, ask for concessions, accept Greenbridge. But it was harder for us to articulate what we were willing to do. Wanting to stop Greenbridge seemed to many people like wanting to prevent the tide from coming in. We needed to make it feel worth the effort. We needed to win something, or to be more fun, or have stronger relationships. Because so many of our actions had to be covert, we could neither defend them in the media or to other participants in the struggle, nor use them to position ourselves as real actors in the fight. Nonetheless, there was a strange interplay between the coalition and the other individuals opposing the development. The size of the coalition and the reputation of some of its members brought the struggle into the public view in a way we might not have been able to accomplish on our own, while covert actions pushed the struggle further. Despite the tensions, these forces had worked in concert. Yet when I moved away from Chapel Hill, out of my home on the block that now lay in the shadow of Greenbridge, I felt we had lost. All 2010. The building was completed that summer and people began to move in. We only saw them when they went out to walk their dogs. They mostly stayed inside their fortress. 
They even had a parking garage in the basement so they could go directly in and out without any danger of running into us. Many of the black renters we'd known were gone, but there were still a couple houses of predominantly white anarchists left. We had instinctively adopted a strategy of trashing that I'd seen in other embattled neighborhoods. The idea is that, paradoxically, the only way to protect your neighborhood from gentrification is to wreck it. You have to make it a place no one wealthier than yourself, no one who had any other option, would ever choose to live. I've had friends who put in a lot of work into improving a space they were renting, only to be kicked out so the landlord could take advantage of their improvements. Likewise, I'd lived in houses where, for a time, we had a sort of renter security on account of how messed up the house was, because the landlords knew they couldn't find anyone else who would be willing to live in such conditions. In the precarity imposed by class warfare, blowing your security deposit on wrecking your own house starts to look more rational than spending that money on renovating someone else's property. Some of this was just putting a brave face on the inevitable challenges of poverty. We had no means of moving that broken, rusty, flat-tired van out of our driveway anyway, so why not toss a moldy mattress on its roof? This might not have gone over so well if our neighbors hadn't already liked us. In any case, from the gentrifier's perspective, being an all-white household surely canceled out the effects of our untidiness. The real problem with this approach is that it applies symptomatic treatment to a systemic problem. Gentrifiers seek out neighborhoods in which property values have dropped low enough that new investments can turn a quick profit. Landlords sometimes use arson to clear out tenants and open the way for more profitable development. This doesn't mean that arson can't be turned against the subsequent developments, but it indicates that no amount of damage we could do to our own neighborhoods could suffice to keep us secure once developers' eyes are trained on them. The property managers brought potential buyers into my neighbor's house. He kept trying to interrupt to emphasize what poor shape the place was in. See this, he would point out mournfully, pointing to the warped floorboards or broken piping. Bad craftsmanship. The potential buyers just looked right through him. They weren't interested in the current conditions of the house, but the future market potential of the property. That moldy mattress finally turned up on the sidewalk in front of Greenbridge. It remained there for several days. They didn't seem to have their act together. Maybe the recession had disoriented them. In a fulfillment of broken window theory, we shifted to trashing their block rather than ours. Rumors of a competition spread around town. Who could leave the most extreme garbage in front of their property? Every time any of us walked past Greenbridge, we would pull the trash bags out of the garbage cans in front of it and empty them onto the sidewalk. The place started to look downwardly mobile, with compost, empty pizza boxes, and the occasional broken bottle contrasting with its fancy facade. I heard a rumor that someone used wheat paste to produce the impression that used condoms had been slung across its windows. Someone else apparently hauled the eviscerated carcass of a roadkill deer up to the doorstep, leaving a trail of blood leading back into the neighborhood that the developers still insisted welcomed them. All this while the developers were scrambling to find buyers for ten stories of condominiums, and the economy was plunged in recession. Winter 2011 Despite the recession, all around us, young white professionals and college kids were moving into the neighborhood. Our dear neighbors were evicted from their home with little warning. The head of their household was the heart of the neighborhood, with an open door and delicious food to share. She offered refuge for many young people in the neighborhood and knew how to keep them out of trouble. The landlord's excuse was that the house needed to be repaired and that the family would be welcome to apply to rent it afterwards, just like anyone else. They had to move away to another city. The youngest son was forced to switch schools just after being accepted onto his high school football team. The landlord did a month of, neg <coughs> the landlord did a month of negligible repairs on the house and put it on the market. Someone repeatedly stole the for sale sign out of the yard until the landlord had to keep it in the window. Finally, the house was rented out at something like double the old rent. The nice white couple that moved in reported to us that the landlord had told them that the previous tenants had died. Spring 2011 In March, we read in the paper that, contrary to earlier reports, Greenbridge had filled fewer than half of its units. The developers owed the bank $28.7 million. For the first time, the possibility of foreclosure loomed. 
It seemed crazy. Foreclosure was what happened to people like us, not to multi-million dollar investors. The recession had turned the world upside down. Someone was killing the trees planted along the sidewalk in front of Greenbridge, presumably dosing them repeatedly with salt water. Their dead branches looked positively funereal in front of the empty shop fronts on the ground floor. Get Out was painted in glass etching solution on the window of the sole occupied shop front, an art boutique clearly not intended to serve the neighborhood. Determined to maintain market-friendly positive vibes, the shop owners attempted to adjust the graffiti to read, Get Art. In April, Bank of America initiated foreclosure proceedings against Greenbridge. A deadline was set for June for them to find new investors to keep the project afloat. Meanwhile, the displacements continued. My favorite neighbors had been forced to move to Durham, along with several other friends of mine, and the household of anarchists across the street from us had just received notice that they would have to clear out. For repairs, as the property owner explained. We were certain our house was next, and we had nowhere to go. This was the climate in which anarchists finally began to discuss organizing a public demonstration against Greenbridge. The idea was to discourage investors from rescuing the project, and also, if the development did go bankrupt, to emphasize that this had been the result of popular opposition, not just the recession. The drawbacks of the purely clandestine approach had become obvious. Now that the coalition had shifted its focus, the only coordinates left on the train were the good citizens who publicly supported the development, the silent majority that privately disapproved of it, and secretive criminal resistance. Yet this isolation was self-perpetuating. The demonstration was promoted only by word of mouth. On June 18, a week before the deadline that had been set for foreclosure, a crowd arrived at the gates of Greenbridge. A dozen people remained outside holding banners. Honk if you can't pay your rent. Greenbridge is closed. Total war on gentrification. Dozens more entered the lobby, chanting and making considerable noise, most of them wearing masks. Two without masks delivered coffee and a muffin to the employee behind the desk, informing him that he was not in danger. Others made barricades out of the chic furniture. The atmosphere was charged. Several years of bottled tension were finally exploding into the open, and the results exceeded everyone's expectations. When the police arrived, the group withdrew through a side door. Three people were arrested as the rest escaped. The demonstration in front of the building continued as the image of Greenbridge surrounded by police was inscribed on the public consciousness. I was one of the arrestees. The police took us to the police station for processing, then to the county jail. We were charged with felony riot and a couple counts of property destruction. They put me in a cell with white supremacists who told me they were waiting to go to trial for homicide. Harold and Kumar escaped from Guantanamo Bay came on the TV. We were dressed in orange jumpsuits, watching prisoners dressed in orange jumpsuits on television. America. The next day, the sun rose to reveal fresh graffiti on the development. Protesters blanketed the walls, proclaiming, Greenbridge, total fail. Police circled the neighborhood. The whole town was tense. Whether you were a developer or a protester, anything associated with Greenbridge felt toxic. A local liberal blog, the first news source to report on the incident, alleged all sorts of nonsense, including, hilariously, that the participants were armed with an anvil. Imagine us lugging an anvil into the lobby, with which to do what, precisely? As best as anyone could make it out, the blogger, who was not present, must have misheard the word handbill. The corporate media followed suit, plastering our faces on the front page with the words vandalism and riot in every article. Further articles appeared throughout the week, in which the developer's perspective was reprinted verbatim, with one of them falsely asserting that protesters had broken windows, and the mayor promised to inflict the worst possible consequences. After the papers printed my address, vigilantes from the development showed up looking for me there and at the local radical bookstore. They didn't find me, but they made threats to anyone who would listen. Like I said, it was tense. This heavy-handed response completed the process of permanently associating Greenbridge with calamity, public outcry, and misfortune. In bringing all their leverage to bear on demonizing the protesters, the developers secured the cement blocks of disaster around their feet. They were sunk. On July 2nd, the same network staged another demonstration at the development. This one was widely promoted. 
but the aftermath of the previous protests had been so intimidating that there were practically no new faces besides a large contingent of police and a few fake counter-protesters to give quips to the media. Nevertheless, this demonstration served to counter the narrative that the opposition to Greenbridge was just a few secretive criminals who could be cowed into silence by a crackdown. Although open protests had been effectively marginalized, there was more neighborhood support than many of us feared in the paranoid days immediately following the arrests. Many residents understood why people would go in and tear up the development. An African-American family living immediately across the street from Greenbridge expressed in conversation that they would be happy to see someone blow it up, so long as the wreckage didn't fall on them. I spoke with my public defender about my case. Since I had not been masked and had done nothing more than reassure the concierge, I'm not in danger, he had reported on the 911 recording. They're being very polite to me. Could they make the charges of vandalism and riot stick? She explained to me that, per North Carolina law, any participant in a demonstration can be found guilty of damages committed by any other participant. In moving furniture, other protesters had apparently scuffed the floor and broken a vase. Greenbridge had assessed the cost at $3,400, well over the minimum to qualify as a felony. You could run around our house with a baseball bat for 10 minutes without doing enough damage to make it a felony. Fall 2011 The foreclosure sale, set for September 15, was delayed to November 7th. The bank didn't want to be responsible for the property either. It was a liability for everyone. In October, a group of out-of-town investors bought Greenbridge from the bank. The mayor had been scrambling all summer to arrange a solution. With two-thirds of the units empty, a lien on the property blocked further sales, only the cheapest units in the building had sold out. Tim Tobin appeared in the papers acknowledging that he and his partners had lost everything. The building contractors lost $6 million too. The official narrative was that Greenbridge failed on account of the recession, but everyone knows there was more to it. The climate of opposition punctuated by protests and vandalism rendered everything associated with the development toxic. No one who could afford to buy an expensive condominium wanted to live in such a controversial space. The student coalition had already moved on to other things. A group of them came by my house one day. The oldest one explained that they were campaigning for an ordinance that would penalize renters for having too many vehicles parked on their property. This was their idea of helping out in the neighborhood. I walked them a few feet down the street. Look, I said, pointing at the house my Mexican neighbors rented next door, out of which they ran their painting business. How many vehicles do you see parked there? Six, seven, he admitted, waving the younger volunteers on so they wouldn't hear our conversation. And who do you think that ordinance is going to be used against if you get it passed? Just white students? He mumbled something about how it wasn't perfect, but it was important to help locals with their initiatives. Motherfucker didn't even live in our neighborhood. Winter 2012 Greenbridge sat dark and empty at the end of our block a hulking monument to hubris and failure, something out of Shelley's Ozymandias. The dead trees planted in front of it had been cut down, leaving only stumps. I was the last of our original household left. The other household of anarchists had been pushed out for repairs. Like the black renters I had known, their houses all reopened without significant changes, but drastically more expensive. The only survivors of the neighborhood that preceded our arrival were black homeowners like my neighbor, who was over 90 and wouldn't be there much longer. The neighborhood only looked like its old self when all the former residents returned to the church for funerals. Our long war with Tim Tobin ended with a surreal twist. On December 1st, the bankrupted millionaire ran an editorial in the local paper entitled, Time to Take Direct Action. After the failure of his green development scheme, he had read Derek Jensen's book, Deep Green Resistance, and changed his tune. Quote, I agree with Jensen that all options must be on the table. The mainstream environmental movement has failed to slow the industrial juggernaut that puts our planet and the children of all species in peril. It is time for direct action of every type, and it's encouraging to see more in creative uses of civil disobedience. We are in financial, social, and ecological crisis, and I'm grateful to all who are willing to take risks of every sort to fundamentally alter America's direction. End quote. 
Anarchists read this in disbelief, some still dealing with the legal repercussions of engaging in direct action against the gentrification of Northside, for which Tobin remained unapologetic. But it was no fluke. A year and a half later, in a newspaper interview beginning with the words, Tim Tobin says the anarchists had a point. He argued that anarchists were right to assert that there was no capitalist solution for ecological crisis. What are we to conclude from this? One way to understand Tobin's conversion is that it was the effect of being drawn into dialogue, albeit a dialogue of pure force. He who does battle with monsters should take care lest he become a monster, as Nietzsche put it. Something similar arguably happened to the liberal journalist Chris Hedges, whose vituperative attacks on black bloc anarchists in the waning days of the Occupy movement occasioned a great deal of outrage. A year later, he was approvingly publishing quotations from Alexander Bergman, the anarchist revolutionary who tried to kill industrialist Henry Clay Frick. Neither Tobin nor Hedges are comrades, but in shifting their positions, they contribute to shifting the public discourse, which changes the social terrain on which we engage. If social conflict intensifies on a large scale, we can expect more of these ambiguous defections from the enemy camp. Perhaps the lesson is that we can change the hearts and minds of our enemies, but only if we beat them. Had Tobin's development succeeded, he would never have had any incentive to reconsider his politics. Summer 2012 My last week on the block, as I was lugging things out into the U-Haul, people from the neighborhood kept coming by to tell me how much they would miss having me around. That felt good. We'd made a lot of enemies during our years there, but only in high places. After the rental agency forced us out of our house, they cut down the last trees on the property. They cut another driveway into the front yard so the soil where our passion flowers had grown was replaced by cement. They tore down the blackberry bushes that had grown from the garden bed to fill our blender with fruit every summer. They tore down the garage and back where we had mailed books to prisoners for half a decade, leaving only a stark concrete platform. I went by to see it once and could hardly bear to look. The condominiums at the top of the street were still empty, along with the shop fronts at street level, and the empty lot the developers had purchased on the other side of the street. Neither the community plaza the developers had promised, nor the education center preserving Northside's history, ever materialized. Everyone had lost. The developers, the building contractors, the protesters, the renters, the original fixed-income homeowners. As bad as it was, it was a better outcome than I'd seen in other anti-gentrification struggles around the country. Usually, a capitalist can steamroll over a neighborhood with no consequences at all. It's not easy fighting against the economy itself. Over the next two years, several more gigantic mixed-use buildings were completed downtown, with a lot less resistance. The last affordable apartment complexes in the area were sold to companies that jacked up the prices to force out the poor. There were a couple well-attended protest marches, and fake advertisements appeared promoting the new owners in terms that made their racism explicit, but nothing comparable to the furor surrounding the construction of Greenbridge. In bankrupting that development, we'd won an unlikely victory, but we hadn't laid a sufficient foundation for a broader struggle against gentrification. Years later, my old housemates and I argued about how to represent the story of the struggle for Northside. I worry that people will read the account as presenting a binary choice between let them lead and go rogue. I'm not trying to promote going rogue exactly, though I think it's important for us to act from our real beliefs and conditions. If you want to support the initiatives of those with less leverage, don't start with community leaders. Start with those who are most overlooked. That reminds me. I wish you'd talked about the listening projects. When you ask people to consider their histories anew, they become people with stories, people whose stories matter, which can actually promote activity for people disenfranchised from history. Asking each other where we came from can help reveal where we might want to go together. You hinted that it can be a way of burying the past struggles, but it could also be a way of staking claim to a place. If we could do everything over again, my dearest wish would be to start some kind of assembly with other disenfranchised renters, like A's family across the street. Even though we were separated by race, they were the ones I felt closest to. I doubt it could have been something formal. I imagine they were used to being marginalized by every formal process, including the ones in the neighborhood. I agree. 
but you have to admit that if we had gotten an assembly of poor renters going, it would have caused some serious blowback. Some of those renters were in houses owned by black families from Northside who had a totally different take on Greenbridge and everything else. Like one of the ways I played my position on that block was by representing the problems A's family faced to L's family in the best light, since there were connections between L's family and the folks who owned the house A's family rented. When the pigs were all up in A's driveway, I had to go explain that it was because someone had a taillight out. That was me being a white ally. L's daughters trusted me more than A's family. Isn't that some shit? My point is that if we'd been rolling with the other renters, you can be sure that not just the developers and the police, but also the local homeowners would have pulled out all the stops to divide and criminalize us. And it could have gone really badly for our neighbors if they were associated with some of the things we did. Yeah, there were all sorts of obstacles. But when y'all went door to door with that statement against the development, everyone signed it. I think there was a window when we could have done our own public organizing, even if we didn't want to work with the other organizations. I wonder if we had been in dialogue with people who didn't share our politics, what if we felt so responsible to them that some of the spikier things wouldn't have happened? What if we were able to do our part to drive Greenbridge into bankruptcy because we weren't working with other people? But our goal wasn't just to stop one development. Remember how they always repeated that gentrification had been going on for decades and it wasn't just about Greenbridge? That should have been our line. They shouldn't have been able to use that against us. That's classic. When we focus on the symptom, they point to the cause. When we focus on the cause, they point to the symptoms. We shouldn't have limited it to one target. We should have had a longer-term strategy based on our analysis. This is a situation you always talk about, where we win something unexpectedly without any larger game plan. What would the alternative be? To take on the whole rental market? What if we had? What would that have looked like? We can fantasize about a rent strike or whatever, but seriously, what would the intermediate steps have been? We could have advertised an autonomous neighborhood assembly, like you say. No cops, politicians, developers, or landlords allowed. The worst that could have happened would have been a meeting of a few local radicals. Trying wouldn't have cost us anything. You're right that it would have been controversial, but getting those conflicts out in the open is just as important as taking on the developers. <laughs>